presentation on a really important subject, how to get every participant to prepare for a new faculty workshop. But <laughs> Andy's not talking about the students in classrooms, but the same principles apply. Uh, Andy Gavron is a professor of physics at uh, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis, I think the longest institutional name of all any of our presenters and institutions. Uh, Andy is currently head of the uh, department at IUPUI. Uh, he served as an associate dean there, and at the same time he's maintained a very active research program in condensed matter physics, focusing on nanostructure and ferromagnetic material. So I'll turn things over to Andy. Um, all right, we're on. Can everybody hear me in the back? You have to say something. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. yeah. excellent. Good. Good. Um, so, uh, as Bob said, my my goal here is to talk about a way. And it's not the only way of getting students to be well prepared for class, and perhaps more importantly, getting faculty to be well prepared for class. That was initially a byproduct of the. Um, method that, that I'm going to describe today, but it turned out probably to be at least as important, if not more important, in retrospect. So as you know, I asked you all to do a little bit of reading, just a few pages, and then to answer some questions before the workshop began. And, and many of you did that, and I really appreciate that. And I just wanted to look at a few of the comments that you gave at the end of that uh, assignment. So, so there were questions about how to engage students in the warm-up exercises. It's formative, so some students probably just don't care. And there were also questions about incentivizing students to do it. I will get to that, but in fact, the, the thing that I want to say right up front is that it's actually not very hard at all. Um, and I will talk about this later on. And I will weave those comments into a topic that's extremely important that I'm sure you're all very interested in, which will be revealed in a slide or two. Um, is Google Docs a universally good method? Well, I don't know. In fact, this was the first time I ever tried it with Google Docs. Uh, how did it work for you? People were nodding. It was a good experience. It worked very good. It took me 10 minutes to put that thing together. And um, in fact, let me go back for a moment. There is a URL here. Uh, this will get distributed, but if you uh, were to record that, that website will have all of these slides. Everything will also go up on Compadre, but there's also some handouts and some other materials available there that you may find useful afterwards. Um, so back to these. So I, I thought Google Docs worked pretty well. And um, it, it puts all of your responses neatly in the order that they arrived in a spreadsheet, in the um, you know, in columns under your uh, under the, the titles of the questions. It worked very well for me, and I may well use it in the future. But I'll say, if your campuses have Blackboard or Desire to Learn or any other course management system, those generally work equally well and your students may find them more comfortable if they're using them for other classes. Um, yeah, incentives, we'll talk about that. And in general, I think what this all comes down to is buy-in. And yes, as a faculty member, you definitely need to buy in. And if you do, and you communicate the reason why, then I think you'll find that your students buy in as well. So just a brief outline um, after a few more introductory remarks. I will spend most of the time talking about just-in-time teaching. I'll start out with a little bit of background theory, if you will. Uh, then I'll spend most of the time on implementation. And um, this is that topic that I suspect is very dear to many of you. Um, and the way you get students to buy in is very much tied in with, with that topic. And I will give you my uh, five minute uh, lightning introduction to how to get good teaching evaluations. We'll talk about assessment and then uh, let you get started on, on thinking about how to do this. So this was the first question I asked. Uh, how did you decide how to teach? 
And the answers I got, I'm going to show you the first four answers that came in. Primarily on my personal experiences as an undergraduate student. Um, drew on previous knowledge, both from my time as a student, as an instructor, based on my own experience as a student. Um, decided to teach based on my previous experiences. As a student. These are literally the first four that came in. Do you sense a pattern? <laughs> What's the pattern here, folks? It worked for me. It worked for us, right. And therein lies a problem. Um, the result of doing things that way is that what you get is classes that are really good for people who are future faculty members. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a lot of selection bias going on in there. That's not a good way of determining what's good for a class because the fact is, what, maybe half a percent of your students are in fact future faculty members? So if you use that huge selection bias and you figure out how to teach a class based on what's good for faculty, what you wind up with is something that's not good for students. Um, students in general are not motivated to be experts. And there's a, there's a big literature on what uh, are the necessary requisites for expertise, for the development of expertise and what constitutes expertise. And your students are not going there by the way. Sure, a half a percent are, but that's not why you're teaching. Um, students in general need more time to think. We're, we are self-selected. We're a group in general that's very good at thinking on our feet. We're also very good at working alone. We're very good at judging our own performance. We have what education jargon calls metacognitive skills. We know how to think about our own learning process. And most of our students don't. Depending on what type of institution you uh, are a member of, your students may also be under much greater pressure to family or work or other considerations than you were when you were an undergraduate. Uh, this guy, Richard Felder, is a professor emeritus of chemical engineering in North Carolina. And on that website, there's a number of references to his work. He's done a great deal of work on, on understanding the differences between how typical students learn and how uh, atypical students, including future faculty, learn. Um, so just a, a quick digression. I used to give this talk without the warm-up. It was very ironic. And, and what I would do was I would stand here and, and I would say, okay, so somebody tell me, what's, how did you learn how to teach? How about you, sir? How about you, ma'am? And, and we'd spend 10 minutes doing that, and it would be a nice discussion, but we don't get to talk about it because we spend all the time gathering data. By gathering that data from you in advance, we can think about, we can spend some time thinking about stuff like the differences between students and faculty. Uh, in other words, I can get to greater depth, and that's often a question. Does this get in the way? Do you get to cover as much material? I get to cover more material by doing this, because you offload from the classroom some basic kinds of learning that students can do on their own, and then the classroom can be devoted to deeper work. Um, so this is a solution to this type of thing, to, to this difference between the way students learn and the way faculty learn. There are many proposed ideas, but one of the underlying themes is active learning. It's the idea that those people in the room who are thinking actively about the subject are the ones who are most likely to gain from the activity. Does that surprise anyone? I didn't think so. Um, and, and this has been proven uh, in many ways, and it's used extensively in lots of different places, you know, research universities, small colleges, uh, you know, master's institutions and, and um, less prestigious public institutions, military academies, all kinds of different places, community college. And one of the reasons why it works is, is because students think. Um, there are a number of other things. What I've done here is, is I have combined education jargon and buzzwords 
with fairly normal phraseology. Um, so active learning, that, that's just a buzzword. It means that the students have to think. And it's no surprise to anyone that if they think, they're more likely to learn. Um, it's also student-centered. Students can tell when you're asking them about what they think about the subject, and then you're basing your classroom uh, presentation on what they said, that it's not about you, it's about them. And it's not obvious if you just walk in with notes that you've been using for several semesters or possibly several decades, <laughs> and um, basically copy your notes onto the board so that they can then copy them down and everybody can decide to think about it later. Um, it's formative assessment. It's, what, what that means is real-time feedback. Students can find out right on the spot how they're doing compared to their peers, compared to whatever standards you might be setting. If they're lost, they know they're lost. I mentioned earlier, they're not good, they don't have good metacognitive skills. They're not good at thinking about their own learning process. So if you put opportunities before them that allow them to get insight into their own learning, then it's a tremendous benefit. And many of the different techniques that you're going to learn about over the next couple of days include these elements. It includes peer interaction. I'll talk about how that works in a little bit. Um, there are, it addresses many of these different learning styles. And in many ways, what it does is, is it brings some of that feeling of apprenticeship. In, when, I think most faculty, if you really push them and ask you, know, when did you learn the most? You learn the most during your PhD research when you were working with your advisor. You know, you're talking day after day with your advisor, with a postdoc, with your peers in the lab, and, and you're fully engaged with the subject. That's when you learn. You don't learn by watching other people talk. Okay, you learn by doing. And there's no better way of doing than engaging one-on-one -on -one with somebody else. Uh, so this and many other techniques attempt to bring at least a piece of that excitement and that engagement to a, a more traditional classroom setting. So that's the background. Now um, I want to get into the implementation part. Uh, so this is, this is where we started out. The, the Just-in-time teaching was developed by collaborators across three institutions. IUPUI is a public urban university, 30,000 students, almost no dorms. Everybody's a commuter. They work in their car in the parking lot. Um, most of them have large part-time or full-time jobs. Many of them have families. The average age of my students is 27. Um, U.S. Military Academy, a, an entirely different kind of environment. Everybody lives on campus. Everybody gets up in the morning and does calisthenics. Um, almost everybody or everybody plays on a sports team. Uh, and Davidson College, a small liberal arts college in a rural setting, quite a prestigious group, highly selective, very small classes. Uh, if it works in all of those places, I guarantee, it were, everyone will ask at, the, at some point, would this really work for my students? The answer is yes. Okay? It's been tried at every possible kind of institution. So I asked the question, what is just-in-time teaching? Um, and it's obvious to me that a lot of you read the material because you gave really good answers. So here's, I just want to flip through a few of them. Um, a method to make students think about the topic before class. Would anybody like to question that that would be a good thing? Okay, once in a while someone will say, no, I'd rather have students uh, learn about it from me and it's a surprise. But I, I really don't think that's beneficial. <laughs> um, it's trying to get students somewhat familiar with the concept before class begins so that class discussions are more meaningful and engaging. Um, let, let me get just a sense of, of what your teaching environments are like. How many of you are primarily teaching classes with less than 30 students? Okay, 30 to say 75. 
and then more than 75, more than 150. Okay, a few. And, and probably it's going to swap around a bunch. Uh, I personally, I, I have 112 as of yesterday at least. Uh, although I think today was withdrawal day, so <laughs> I may have a few less when I get back. Um, it's hard to get students, you know, outside of a seminar setting to talk to one another. And as I just said, that, that engagement is a critical part, that discussing the subject is a critical part of this. Um, it's moving all of the introduction, I don't know about all, but most at least of the introduction and most of the learning into the hands of students, leaving class time for higher order learning activities. I want to get a sense. What, what could so, I mean, that's completely correct and a good, and a good answer. Do any of you, I, I'd like to hear some ideas about what would be some higher order learning activities. What would you really like your students to be able to do in class? Yeah. Read something in the chapter and then actually be able to solve the problem about it. Like build a circuit about something that they read about. They okay, work. right. So build so actually that that could be a pre-lab assignment where they have to learn about what the at the schematic level and then they actually build and make measurements. Uh, and and problem solving also. Yes. yes. Being able to ask further questions. Uh, yes, very good. Being able to ask deeper questions. If students are asking the question, what's the definition of work? Then you're repeating in class the definition of work, which was already available to them in advance. If, on the other hand, students come into class knowing the definition of work, then they can ask a more subtle question. They can ask why, you know, so work is related to kinetic energy. Is it related to any other kind of energy? Then you can say, oh, okay, good question. We'll be talking about potential energy and the connection to work next time. Very good. You know, they're making, they're making those connections in advance. Um, other, other ideas. What else could students do? Well, yeah. well, sometimes I give them some short problems or clickers to you know, ask a question. Now, if they're already familiar with say, what is Newton's law, they will be able to do it better and have a better discussion among themselves. Yeah, exactly. So, so clickers are another example. You'll hear m plenty more about clickers over the next 72 hours. Um, and I won't spoil it for you. But um, yeah, if, if you've got students doing some sort of think, pair, share activity or, or uh, clicker problems, discussions, then this allows you to move it to a deeper level, to a, to a higher level, to a more subtle level, if you will. Um, or, or simply to plow through. I know many of us, particularly if you're teaching introductory level classes, you have to cover a lot of stuff. And if you try and cover it all in class, you cover it in a very shallow way. But if students can offload some of the learning, not, not all, but some of the learning of the easier topics, then you can spend your class time more wisely. Um, a last one, I, I love this uh, description. Students take a bite first, and then the instructor helps students digest the material through in-class activities. I thought that was a wonderful metaphor for what just-in-time teaching is and, and how it works. The discussion points in class are oriented by the feedback from students. And that word feedback is important. I want to draw your attention to that. Okay, here's one more example of, of a great answer that somebody gave. Students also provide feedback to the instructor before lecture. This allows the students to come to lecture more prepared to learn and the professor to tailor lectures to the students. Um, now this has all been text and many of us are good with text, but many of us are also good with pictures. So, so this is the take home slide. If you remember nothing, if you want to take one photograph of my slides, this is the one to take. Just in time teaching is feedback between homework and classroom mediated by the World Wide Web uh, or some other technology. It doesn't have to be the web, but that's commonplace. And then through assessment, through assignment design, 
the information that you glean in the classroom then goes back into the next homework or the next semester's homework. So feedback from what students are doing at home to what students are doing in class, and that makes both better, both more effective. Um, just to summarize it, it it's, a, it's a very adaptable technique. Notice that I haven't given you a lot of details. I can talk about details, and by the way, you can stop me with questions anytime. I'm easily stoppable. Um, but there are, uh, okay, uh, queue, you're, you're in the queue, you're in the queue. So, so the idea here is that this should be a very adaptable technique, and whatever your situation is, you may use just-in-time teaching in one way or another. The only fundamental is that idea of feedback between what students do at home and what they do in the classroom. Now, go ahead. Sorry, I don't. I no problem. problem. No. On your previous slide, I guess I was a little bit confused. Uh, so, so it was a connection between homework and what happened in class via um, modifications from class and then the, the feedback. Is there, is, is homework the same thing as this pre-class work or is there two different Ah, classes? okay, good question. Yeah, um, so let me go back there. This piece, in, in this picture is the, is the pre-class question, the, what I call a warm-up exercise. What in some places, at the Air Force Academy, they call them pre-flight checks. Uh, in other places, they call them checkpoints. Um, that, that's what I'm talking about here. Now, there are also regular problem sets. Um, this is in addition to the regular problem sets, and it has a very different purpose. Uh, the purpose here is really to get students and faculty on the same page for the classroom. The problem set is unchanged. It's unchanged probably for decades. Uh, it's, it's really the point, and it comes later in the learning cycle for students to really practice with the stuff after they've seen it, uh, read about it in the book, after they've come to done this warm-up exercise, after it's been presented and discussed in class, then the problem set comes and they do the real wrestling with, with hard problem solving. So there are two kinds of homework and this is one of those. Okay. Yeah. So I want to point out the obvious problem. Because, yeah. Uh, let's suppose that one was busy writing an NSF proposal and one did not read any of the material in the class that they referred. So one sees here and hears about cheated and knows nothing about what it is. And so one is now lost Probably going to fail the class. Well, I hope it doesn't hurt your GPA too much. <laughs> <laughs> that is part of the incentive. Students will figure out very quickly that class time is much more beneficial if they do this than if they do not. Um, but it is part of the assignment. I mean, you, you, could, you could ask that question about anything, including regular problem sets or any sort of preparation for, for any part of life. If students are going to learn physics at the university level, they have to invest some time. The question is how you ask them to invest their time and what is the best way of doing it. Um, I, I, I will try and say a few things to catch up those who did have NSF proposals due, and I know that there were many because I was reading them for some of my junior faculty members and providing feedback. Um, but um, it, it is, uh, and, and of course we can discuss later and you can also go back and read a little bit online later. But, but my fundamental point here is that students need to invest some time. And if you make it clear to them that by investing their time in certain ways they will learn more and they will benefit as future scientists, engineers, doctors, lawyers, whatever, then they will be willing to put in that time and, and, and they'll, they'll, buy, they'll buy in. Yes? Oh, okay, just a last yeah. fall. Yeah. So I, I didn't really mean to. Well, to <laughs> I, what I want to say is so many more to say. Now, this probably one, there will be a week for every student who is too busy for whatever reason. Yes. So you will not a perfect class. Mm -hmm. And in this class, he gets lost. And once he gets lost, you may get lost for the end of the semester. So I would say that you run the risk that by the end of the semester, you lose many of the students. 
Okay, the, the data shows otherwise. That, that in fact, the number of students succeeding in the class goes up significantly. And also that the students report that their study habits improve as a result of being given this structure for preparing. But of course, some students will be unprepared for a given class no matter what you're doing. And you can't completely pass them by. It's, it's not a question of ignoring the introduction of the material. It's a question of adjusting the percentages. Okay? Now, yeah. yeah. My students would ask, is this for credit? Ah, <laughs> yes. And the answer is, at least for me, the answer is yes. I do give credit, and in fact, I give it very readily. These assignments are graded for, in, in when I do it, and, and this is not required, but my recommendation and my preference is the following. They're graded all or nothing. So you either get all the points or you get a zero. And they're graded for effort. So if you, if you made any kind of real effort, if, if, if your answer to the question is literally an answer to the question, then I give full credit. You don't have to be correct. And students appreciate that because after all, you're asking them about stuff you haven't discussed yet. So they feel it's fair if you do it that way. Um, and, and in fact, the net result in my class is that 90% of the students get 90% of the credit. So it doesn't change anybody's grade at all. It just changes how well prepared they are for the exams. So everybody goes up. Just yeah? Do you read 112 of these before class? No, I do not. Good question. I, this is wonderful. You're answer, asking all the questions to which there will be answers on later slides. So if I never get to the slides, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's the way this should be. And that's the way your class should be. Um, you don't have to read all 112 of them before class because you know what you're looking for. So you just skim the answers before class, pull out a few gems that are going to be particularly useful to discuss in class, as I did. And then the process of grading goes on later. Uh, the way I do it with 112 students, I simply give everybody credit whose name appears as having submitted something. Then I scan through it for complete blather and I take a point away from that you know, two out of 100 students that experimented at the beginning of the semester with typing blah, 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 or, you know, <laughs> ASDFJKL semicolon. You know, I take those points away. Uh, or if they, if they write, don't know. Well, no, you don't get a point for don't know. <laughs> but but if, if, they, if they said something halfway sensible, I give them the credit. And in fact, they, and, and then when I use them in class, I praise the ones that are good. And students like to get that. They like to see their name up in lights. And so it becomes an incentive to think a little bit more carefully about it. And I also give them hints on how to write. And writing, communicating about science, is an important learning goal, especially at the introductory level. Yeah? yeah I'm not going to respond. I'm worried about having all teaching by this way, discussion, something in the business. So the lecture time, which I'm going to give the students the basic concept in the way I think it's right for uh -huh. the student to understand the subject is going to be missed. Uh -huh. And they depend on the student learning only by what they are learning. And they can miss something very important. So I think the way to do it is to have lecture, which is keep the lecture, and then give lecture, and then have discussion. Uh -huh. Have discussion, which we can do just in time. Discussion is also better for that. And you, lecture, but I, but I don't think we can, we can okay. just spend the idea of giving lectures. So, and, and I do, in fact, give lectures. I give significantly. I mean, I'm up here giving a lecture to you. Uh, and I'm modeling this fairly closely to the way I would do it. I would say in my class, in 50 minutes, um, I am lecturing for 30 minutes, at least, possibly 35. The other time I'm having my students discuss or we're doing clicker exercises or something. So I agree with you in the sense that a faculty member presenting material clearly and, and talking about the importance of the material, about what's so wonderful about physics. I mean, uh, this, this is, we love this stuff. And to show your students that passion, that, that 
fascination with physics and how it helps us to understand the world, of course you have to do that. What I would argue with is the notion that if you say something clearly the way you understand it for, th for five minutes on Tuesday, six weeks later students are able to apply that knowledge. It doesn't work that way. They're not that good at picking it up. And in fact, there are tons, tons of experiments, tons of data. Um, you know, Dr. McDermott talked about it a little bit last night. Uh, others will talk about it during the next couple days. The fact is it has been shown time and again that a smart professor explaining very clearly exactly how something works accomplishes almost nothing in terms of students' ability to apply that knowledge to solve problems at a future date. It, it really, it works for people like us, but it doesn't work for the majority of the students in your class unless you're teaching a graduate level course at an R1 institution, in which case your students are so pre-selected that you probably got the ones who will benefit from that treatment. But if you're teaching an intro level class or non-majors or even early physics majors, undergraduate, chances are a perfect clear lecture isn't as good as it feels to us. Yes? My question is, if they're doing it reading ahead of time, how much are you going to bore them as an huh? introduction of your lecture? Right, that's like the, the inverse question. Um, I, 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 I try not to bore them, and generally I think I don't. Um, all students will be bored some of the time and, and challenged some of the time in any typical classroom situation. Pitching, and, and it depends a lot on how diverse the abilities of the learners in your classroom are. Uh, teaching at a public urban university, I have students who, are, who could have been at an Ivy League school, but either can't afford it or have family um, issues that they're place bound and, and, and they wind up at my place and they're, they're brilliant, they're excellent students. And then I have other students who are absolutely struggling to get by. Um, so you, you always face that as an instructor. What I would argue is having information about what the students are thinking in advance can't hurt. It, it helps you to overcome that barrier, but it, it, it's not a magic bullet. Nothing here is a magic bullet. Yes? How often do you do this for every class? I do this before every lecture class. Right. Okay, yes? So let me make a short comment. So the well, way I do, for example, is rather than asking the question on, say, something like, you know, what is Newton's second law, I just basically give them some sort of open-ended question they typically see in their daily life. Mm -hmm. so, so you start the discussion that way in a class and the instructors just basically summarize and clear up and tidy it up at the, at the end. It's just basically this is all about this one equation. And right. that way students typically don't get bored because they don't see it when they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. This is a great discussion. Let me just see what my next slide Oh yeah, I already showed this slide. So, go ahead. Um, do you include in your syllabus that you will be assigning three class tasks? Absolutely, absolutely. Do um, you, you think you get a better student participation or enrollment in your classes? Or well, my classes are primarily required, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I say not, not the required class, but uh -huh. a graduate level uh -huh. specialized course. I think students yeah. want to learn. Okay. I, I think they do. I, they really do. And, and this, this also, you know, people study how, for instance, student evaluations work. Students don't like being bullied. They don't like being given tasks that are a big surprise, and they especially don't like being given tasks to which they do not see the purpose. But if they see the purpose, and the purpose is to make, to give them a better career, then they will appreciate it, and they will do the work. I, I will say on a future slide, you're a leader. When you walk into a classroom, you're, you're, you're the general. You're the president. 
You're the CEO. You're a leader. You have to make your students into a team that wants to follow you. And that means they have to understand the value. They have to understand that there's a common purpose. And you can do that by explaining to them clearly what the goal is, and the goal is for them. It's not for you. If you're teaching a college class and you're the one that benefits the most, you're stealing their money. If you're teaching a college class or a graduate school class and the goal is to make them a better scientist, a better engineer, whatever, then, then you're doing your job. Yes? When you teach a big class, like 200, 250 class, and you have a lot of students, uh -huh. and you do discussion, and then uh, some, I mean, the, the level is very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you really allow everybody to discuss some of this, this discussion, are very boring for the good students. And sometimes they actually the, the very best students, they get lost. They don't get a lot from the class uh -huh. because we have to, I mean, we have to adopt everyone else. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we actually manage this large class with a very different level. It, and to work for, for, yeah. for the best system or for the whole system. Right. It is hard. And, and I, I could discuss that at, at some future time, I think. Uh, what I would say is, for in this context, getting the information about how good they are in advance is better than not even knowing which one is which, or how much better, or how much worse. Let me check um, on timing. We started a little bit late. Uh, what, what time by the clock do you need me to shut down? Steve? Bob just left, but staying on schedule is good. OK, <laughs> I'll try. 17 I'll, minutes. I'll try that. <laughs> OK, let me. So, so just, just another digression. We could not have had this discussion, I don't think, if I was standing up here defining what is JIT and what's a warm up example. And you know how do you, you know how do you put them on the how do students see them, which is what this would have been about if I hadn't given you that pre-class assignment. So I think there's no doubt, at least in my mind, that by giving you that assignment, we've had a deeper conversation and we've covered more subtle aspects of this than we would have if I was just giving you a talk absolutely cold with no introduction to the idea whatsoever. Uh, you got to preview the important concepts and you got to see it in your own words, not in my words exclusively. I want to give an example of a question. So, so here's a favorite of mine. Um, the question is, is it possible to add heat to an ideal gas without changing its temperature? This is an intro level calculus based class this comes from. If it is possible, please explain how it's done. And these are three real answers from real students that I've had in the past. Uh, this first one, it's not possible because the internal energy of an ideal gas only depends on the temperature. The internal energy will increase when the temperature rises. That's true. That's 100% correct. It's not a 100% complete answer to the question, but it is 100% correct. This last one is a more complete answer to the question. If you add heat to a system, while the system is doing the corresponding amount of work, the temperature will not change. If I had a whiteboard here, I would show you, I can take that, write that down and say, okay, what's the symbol we use for heat? Okay, that's Q. What's the symbol we use for work? What does doing the corresponding amount mean? It means same absolute value. And if the temperature will not change, and this person says that means the energy doesn't change, then the change in energy is equal to, the, is equal to zero, and that's equal to the difference between those two absolute values. I can pull the first law of thermodynamics out of what they say instead of simply going in and writing it on the board and telling them to believe it because it's a law. Okay? They are much happier and much more likely to learn and to understand deeply what the first law of thermodynamics actually tells you if they do it this way than if I simply go and write it down with them unprepared. I'd also like to point out this middle one. It's possible to add heat to an ideal gas without it changing its temperature 
by the gas receiving the heat and the atoms of that gas getting excited enough to disperse that heat as fast as they receive it. If you struggle, you can think of a way that that might correspond to something that's mostly correct, but you have to assume a that the student has a really very subtle knowledge. <laughs> and it really wasn't that subtle a question. What this is, is an indication of, a of an underlying <coughs> theme that runs throughout the way students think about physics which I've observed time and again, and which I never would have known if I didn't assign things like this, which is that students think that if you do things very fast or very slow, then maybe the laws don't count. <laughs> that you can get away with stuff, you can sweep energy under the rug, you can hide things, if, if only the time scale is different enough somehow. You had a question? Yeah, do you ever cheat a little and kind of insert a student comment that you wish somebody would have made? <laughs> you know, I never do. It's never necessary. They always give me plenty of material. Yes? Yeah, so this is a, a similar um, kind of question. So how, this, is, this seems a fairly optimal situation. Uh -huh. You easily pull out the, right. the first law from these comments. Typical so data. Reality, how often was this right? How often can you do that? Um, well, you know, everybody shows what they call typical data, right? Which means yeah. the best data ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm no, no different. <laughs> but I, I would say it's, it's commonplace that you can get something quite good, if, if not perhaps quite so lovely. Uh, oh, yes? Um, so for this example then, would they have say, read a section out of the book that discussed the first law? Yes. And then, OK. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, to comment to these good questions, that something that has been done, that you have a really great answer from last year, and if it really makes the case well, then it's fair to use it. Of course, you want to be honest. You don't want to say, so one of you said this. Uh -huh. but, you know, you can say it in such a way that they yes. I think that would be fair, particularly with a smaller class. Uh, you know, with 100 students, you'll always get something, particularly if you've got some really good students in there. To me, the thing, it, it's remarkable, the thing that is most difficult to me is getting students to write concisely enough that you can get something that fits on the screen. And I need to train them. And, and actually explain to them that, okay, part of writing in a professional setting is getting to the point. You know, just say what's important. Don't, you don't have to fill the screen. I'm not a, a high school English teacher. I will not grade you on the weight of your paper. Okay, just tell me what you think quickly and clearly. Yes? So are you using the, this feedback to illustrate these the concepts that I want to show? I want to look for the good answers, or are you looking for responses that are, we're not supposed to be using the word misconception. Right. <laughs> Good. Uh, are you basically putting up things that are illustrating some of each, some of the pitfalls that, I mean, how, how do you approach yes. this? The answer is definitely some of each. Um, and, I, and I will show you a few ideas about how to do that in a minute. So what makes a good warm up? I think you've all got the idea. I'm just going to race through this thought-provoking and ambiguous so that one can expect many different answers from which, uh, which will be used to further the discussion. It's just what we've been doing. Um, provide an opportunity for a student to show his or her mastery of a topic. I want you to discuss for one minute with the people at your table which of these answers, if either, you like better. We've been discussing just-in-time teaching. So now here are two, these are rather different answers. Turn to your neighbor and discuss. Which one of these do you like, A or B? I mean, if, if you give the type of questions like B, then what happens is that some people have already got it. <laughs> Many of them just don't get it. And we spend a while just teaching the same concept over again. But 
if you actually give a little bit of ambiguous question, but somehow it has to say related to the situation in astronomy, then it's Okay, so I know you're having good conversations. If, if, if we had clickers, I could now ask you to vote, and we could, we could see what the outcome was. But, but just show of hands, who likes A? Who likes B? Okay, so that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. What, so just one person, tell me, what did you like about A better? Someone. Someone. Uh, yeah. There, yeah. there is no judgment uh -huh. attached uh -huh. to A. Okay, good, good. Now B, is there anything good to be said for B? Yes. I like the problem solved. I actually like both. I voted twice. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, good, A good. is good for conceptual understanding, which I think is very important uh -huh. and often very lacking. Um, but at some point, they're going to need to learn the problem solving skills also, in which forcing them to confront where their issues are with the problem solving skills can also be very useful at a time. I, I agree. I, for me personally, I would prefer this for the warm up and this kind of thing for this goal for a later assignment, either a problem set or I do things called weekly puzzles as well. So, so there's, a, there's room for both of these ideas. But, but it's interesting that we had such a, a strong consensus on the one. Yeah? Yeah, just uh, I, I felt we have to be a little careful with the word ambiguous. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think the question is there are multiple possible different answers to this. Yeah, well, like the, the thermodynamics example. I didn't actually say you may, you know, the system is in a flexible container on which work can be done. I, that's what I mean by ambiguous. There's a, there's a little room for students to think differently about what the scope of the question is. Um, so here are some more good thoughts on warm-ups. You can review these slides. I, we're, I'm going to try and keep us on time, so I got shortened by a little bit. I, so I just want to race through a few things. Here's an important point. Here's a link. I have an archive of warm-up exercises for essentially the entire undergraduate curriculum. I didn't write them all, but I have accumulated these from colleagues who have used this technique, some of whom are in this room. Um, and I, I have intro, uh, mechanics, e &M, modern physics, quantum mechanics, uh, statistical, thermo kind of class a math methods class, an astronomy class, and I actually have a set of physical optics ones that I haven't posted yet, but those are coming soon. So, what? Yes, you will get, everything will be made available to you afterwards, so you don't have to write these things down immediately, but I know that was another concern that was expressed on the warm-up, so the answer is yes, there is a ton of materials and you are free to use them, um, modify them if necessary, whatever works for you, for your students. Um, I personally at the moment am using Smart Physics. Uh, this is a commercial product that uh, was developed by folks at University of Illinois that's very supportive of this technique, but there are certainly other ways of doing it. Um, We've already discussed all of this stuff. This is, this is what we do, you know. I, I read the students' responses, pick some out, and use them in class, and, and really have a dialogue based on what students are thinking, rather than just on my own old yellowed notes. Um, choosing students' responses, always say something positive. You don't want to humiliate students. Um, even something that is not a particularly good answer. You can find a way to say something nice about it. No, this makes sense, but there's something missing. This is a great response. How would we know how much heat to add, et cetera? Yeah. Um, along the, same, the lines of um, not wanting to embarrass students, uh -huh. uh, do you attach names? I use the nicknames, just as I did uh, with, with you all. And, and they get used to the idea. And, and if, if a student gives me their real name, in the first week, I don't use that one. I use someone who got the nickname concept down. And then after two or three weeks, once they've all seen how this plays out, then they know, you know not to use their real name if they don't want to. A um, Couple of tips and pitfalls. I just want to race through this. Uh, 
First day of class, explain what you're doing. Make it routine. You can't just pull this on students midway through the semester. It's got to be a regular thing like, you know, I saw homeworks are due on Friday, these are due on Wednesday and Monday, whatever it is. Make it routine. Grade them gently, give a few points as an incentive. Um, you don't need to, you see, I, everyone's already asked these questions. Um, use answers from many students, spread the wealth around, don't, don't just keep picking on your favorites. Don't just say, okay, for the first five minutes of class, we're doing the warm-ups, and then I'm going to go back to my regular lecture. These get woven in throughout the course of the day. Um, Upper-level students or graduate students can handle more exploratory questions. Sometimes having a warm-up where you link the material to a prerequisite course is a useful way of thinking about it. Um, and the results, students are better prepared for class. Faculty are better prepared for students, and class time is spent more productively. Um, now I promise this. So this is the one thing that I don't want to cut off, Bob, because I promised. The first five minutes of your first class are absolutely critical. That's when students decide if they like you. And you may not like the idea, but the fact is they're people. And if they decide in the first five minutes that they don't like you, that you're cruel, that you're boring, that you're unrealistic, whatever, you've lost it. If, on the other hand, you convince them, okay, you're, you're, you're a good person, you're looking out for their best interests, yes, you're going to challenge them, yes, you're going to make them learn a lot, but you're going to go with them and you're going to work as hard as they do, then they'll go along and they will give very good evaluations, excellent evaluations, even to someone who really pushes them. Um, you're building a team. You're being a leader. Yeah? Are you saying that every class period, in the first five minutes, they decided they like you or just when you No, the fir first five minutes of the semester, then it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah? Is there a data to um, some, yes. I, I won't, sh I don't have it, but, but there is data to back up some of this. I mean, some of this, be a leader, that's, that, that, that's a tip. But this first five minutes, that comes from social science. And it's not just true for teachers, it's true for everybody. You meet somebody at a cocktail party, it only takes five minutes to decide whether or not this is somebody that you want to spend the evening talking to. I love you, so, I mean, I received some uh, student feedback and they said, oh, uh -huh. oh, sometimes weird, yes, but and and of course you can you can overcome a bad start. I don't want to mean to, to imply that it's impossible, but those first five minutes are critical. They're extremely important, and you you have to work very hard to overcome a problem that was created at that time. Okay, I'm getting the hook here. <laughs> see, so. Um, I will say I, I have a follow-up session to this. It starts at about 9 o'clock tonight in the bar <laughs> over in the hotel. I'll have a beer and continue this conversation with anyone that feels like having it. Thank you very much.